Preparing to delve in three, two, one. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Delve. My name is Nathan. And I'm Alex. And uh, Alex, boy, it's been a little bit since we recorded it last. It has been a little bit. Yeah, because the internet was being a butt, I think. Yes, the internet is always a butt. Yes. Um, so is life. <laughs> so, is, so is life. Humans are jokes. There you go. Everything is a lie. <laughs> the cake is a lie. Yeah, cake is also a lie. And um, so I got to thinking about something a little while ago, and uh, I wanted to run it by you. Um, I was talking to uh, Dustin about his new game, Heroic Dark, yes. and uh, for people who might have missed that episode, uh, basically the idea behind Heroic Dark was that uh, it was like a, a decentralized uh, system. It was apart from any kind of real setting to create a story about heroes fighting a darkness, and then you could kind of figure out what you wanted to do to make that darkness. Those, those were all story elements that you could add on later. Some of the elements that he was talking about I thought were really interesting, but I was having a really hard time conceptualizing like how it all worked in my head. And then all of a sudden something clicked. Your characters may have successes or failures, but regardless, the, the actual darkness is always going to be raising up in their ability over the course of time. They're consistently getting more powerful. All of a sudden, when he said that, something clicked. And I was like, oh... That sounds like XCOM. You know, the aliens are always going to just get better technology, regardless of what you do. Yeah. So he said, you know, it's funny, because actually I was playing a lot of XCOM when I was making the game. <laughs> and I was like, oh, see, now I understand. And it got me to thinking, like, if he had a, a, like just kind of said at the beginning, you have to think about, like, XCOM. That's a point of reference that I would have understood, and I would have been able to, like, grab right on to that as, as a mechanic in the game. And that just got me to thinking a little bit about, once you have a system, because you've developed systems yourself. Uh, one or two. One yeah. or two, yeah. You know, you can, you can have the system, you can build a system, but how do you, like, tell people, explain to a new player that might not be familiar with your system at all... About your system, how do you do that effectively? And I started to wonder if it might be by referencing other things or trying to compare it to something else that people might be familiar with. Do you think there are ways that people designing a game could explain their mechanics uh, better for new players, like by, for instance, referencing or talking about something people may be more familiar with. Like examples or showing people how to do that? Yeah. I mean, D&D has a really good one. Typically in their starters that are like an example adventure. Mm -hmm. Like an example of the roleplay, for instance, and the what you, the interaction will be. Right, um, right. And that's, that's pretty helpful for people who are like, wait, what? What do you mean I roll this dice and do this thing here? I do appreciate that they do starter adventures, but at, at the same time, I have seen some starter adventures where I still didn't understand how the mechanics worked or how the game worked by looking at that material. And I can, uh, I can actually give you a, a different example. Okay, sure. Which is, is another one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about this. Uh, so I'm actually playing another game. Uh, you might you might have heard about the D and D game I was playing, but I'm actually playing another game in a different system. Which game in which system? <laughs> <laughs> I am actually playing something uh, called uh, The Expendables with uh, Andy Watson, and it is in uh, 1879. The year 1879? No, the the game system is 1879 from okay, Fossil that's... Games. Okay. Okay. All right. See, that's why I was wondering because okay. I think 1879 is a year. Uh, it I is a year. Have not heard that system, it, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the, the and the general idea is that it is set in that time, but the mechanics are completely different. If you're familiar with D and D, it's actually closer to Earth Dawn, which Fasa also makes. It's it's not familiar with that, that one either. They still have conventions for it. Oh, I didn't really know what to do. I didn't know how to develop a character or anything like that. And so the first thing she did was she gave me the, the starter adventure. And so it had some, like, pre-gen characters and stuff like that. 
and I could look at it. And but for me, I was just like looking at a bunch of numbers on a page because I didn't really have a great reference as to what any of it meant. And I I know that wasn't really the intention of a starter adventure, though. Like, it's supposed to be able to get people in and playing the game without getting heady into what any of it is. It's just giving you the basics so that you can figure out if you like it, and then it gives you more as you go. Right, right. And they do assume, like, the person running the game is going to be fully knowledgeable of I don't know if they that. assume that. They I don't? don't know what they assume. <laughs> Sometimes the first time someone's running a game is the first time they've run the game as well. Oh, and that's true. It could be like a completely new group where no one's really a veteran. No one really knows what they're doing. So right. they're kind of going, let's all figure this out together. Right. Yeah. So I, I imagine that if you're having a starter adventure, it would probably be really useful to at least explain to the, the GM how to run things. <laughs> probably I mean, a good idea. It, it helps. Yeah. That's what the sample adventures right. like dialogues right, right, are right, right. too. But now here's here's where things get a little bit complicated for me. I'm looking at it, and I'm looking at, you know, it's a starter adventure, and I'm looking at a character model that I like. I found a weird scientist. and that's, Weird scientists are fantastic. Uh, yes, I am playing a weird scientist, by the way. Uh, for anyone who's interested, I decided to go full 80s on my interpretation. His name is Dr. Ferris McFly. And Ferris McFly. Dr. Ferris McFly. And um, the most recent thing that he invented was like the steampunk equivalent of a bug zapper and I called it Gold Bloom's Revenge. I'm going full eighties oh. for this character. <laughs> Apparently so. Do you have like some neon lights and stuff too? No, but you know what I do have? I have a, a magical like bolt uh, energy gun and I called it the Fires of St. Elmo. Fires of St. Elmo. <laughs> yeah. Alright. I mean that's accurate. Yeah, I thought so. Anyway, I'm having fun with that. But here's the thing that really threw me. So I'm working off of the stats and everything that are on there, but I have no reference point to any of this. And come to find out that actually the character that that I was given from that starter adventure was not actually, like, the stats were actually inflated to what they should have been. So my character was actually OP. (laughs) Oh. And I didn't know that. I just had no reference point. So it turned out that actually my stats were higher than they were supposed to be. You're just an exceptionally good doctor. I'm just a really good, weird scientist. Um, I had more skills than I was supposed to have. There's a whole karma system where you can, like, roll an extra die on different challenges. You're supposed to have, like, around six or something. And it told me I had 18. That's uh, triple what you're supposed to have, Nathan. It's sort of like triple what I'm supposed to have. But those are the stats that I was working... Because I didn't know any better. and so. I I was trying to figure out, like, how could you explain to somebody who is completely a blank slate, completely unaware of how a game works, how could you explain to them the basics of those mechanics and really let them get into the weeds and make it accessible for them? I mean, again, with the example thing, like Mm. telling people if it's a non-verbal way is harder. Mm. So those example texts of, like, what your stats do, what you use them for, uh, what each of them does for a character really helps, because then you go, oh, all right, so strength, what does strength do? And then you can go, oh, strength has to deal with, like, how much you can carry, how hard you hit, you know, but it also can be used for this and that. Mm-hmm. And that's really helpful, too, because then people can kind of, when they're building the characters, can go, hey, okay, I know what this is for. Mm-hmm. This is really useful because my character likes to punch holes in walls. So if we took a, a mechanic like your, your experience limited system where you have percentages, how would you try to explain that to somebody who might not have a real reference point? Is there a reference point that you could use? I mean, for me, it was pretty simple because I broke it down into a chart and then I took the chart and explained exactly how that functioned. Mm -hmm. So you have a visual aid of the percentages and the uh, hit options there, and the success and failure options, Mm -hmm. but then you have explained out how that functions in in a step-by-step manner. So that's how I did that. The the trick there is in rules writing as well, because you need to be able to write it simply enough that people understand it without getting confused. Simple writing is hard. 
That's that's like a golden rule. <laughs> to say something plainly is difficult. Simple writing is hard when you're really deep into a game that you're designing yourself. Yes. Um, because you know how everything functions in your head or right. in test play. Right. But somebody else who's not in your brain might not know a thing about what you're talking about. Something that I thought might be helpful uh, from like the, the examples that I was uh, giving was just if I'm aware of like what your inspiration for things are, then I kind of have at least a baseline that I can work off of. The darkness, if I knew that that was kind of based off of XCOM, well, I got, a, I got that in my head. And I kind of know how those mechanics work. I think the problem, though, is if you're trying to put it down into rules or anything like that, uh, you can't assume that like everyone's going to get that reference. <laughs> Right. Not everyone's going to understand what XCOM is. <laughs> Maybe by, uh, you know, at least talking about, like, what the inspiration is. Like, I'm assuming that you had inspirations behind the systems that you've worked on, that the mechanics that you've built. That is a thing that people do when they're building games. They do lift mechanics from other games and tweak them. Mm. Well, and not necessarily even lift mechanics, but take an idea that you saw somewhere and say, could I make a mechanical version of that? Like, like D and D is actually a pretty good example because if you think about like the fantasy world of D and D and and all of the characters, there's a lot of influence from like Lord of the Rings. Oh yeah, and but that's not on the rules end and the mechanic end. That's on the lore end and how the races all function. But knowing that, you know, kind of like your point of access in some ways is the setting itself, since it is setting specific, and then you can kind of work mechanics. But then the, the mechanics, if you look at different character classes and that kind of thing, they are kind of based off of what the character is supposed to be. Like, you know, you have rage mechanics for a barbarian. You wouldn't necessarily have rage mechanics for another class, but you already have the point of reference that they're a barbarian, so you right. kind of know what they're trying to do, and mechanics make sense to them. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so in some ways, because of the story and because of the narrative, it then informs those mechanics because it has to make sense to what those characters are. I guess are. that makes sense, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was trying to think of a good example of how I've seen this done, and, uh, actually one of the best ones is if you go to D&D &D Beyond, uh, for those characters. Of course, you know, you would, you would certainly hope that the guys at the 800-pound gorilla of the tabletop market would have a pretty good idea of how to explain things. I mean, you say that, yeah, but sometimes they're really bad, too. Uh, a book is worth 50 gold, folks. I think that number's skewed, Nathan. It's, it, it's that's worth... A really, that's a really expensive book. You could go to the D&D Beyond list, I swear. The book is I'm not, worth 50 gold. I don't care gold. what... I don't care if the book is made of 50 gold. Just I'm not paying 50 gold for a book. <laughs> it's, I saw that and I'm like, why are parties not just robbing libraries <laughs> in the game? Uh, you know, that would be... Yeah. But anyway, if you were to look at like just the character class listings, they start not really with the mechanics. They just start with kind of like an example, a characterization of who this person is. It's sort of like just the, the quintessential, what you would think of as a barbarian, for instance. Then they kind of go on to talk about their relationship in the world, how they act, and eventually even give just some ideas of how you create one, and even some quick build rules. You see that all before you ever actually see numbers. Right. That did get me thinking, like, how useful it is to kind of almost prime people for the point where you get into the crunch. Yeah. Like, sometimes I need a little bit of a primer as to what you're, you're trying to accomplish before I see a wall of numbers in front of me. <laughs> yeah, see, I have a, a video game example for that is um, Pathfinder Kingmaker on PC, mm -hmm. and it's played using the Pathfinder settings. Um, and campaign setting, and, well, not campaign setting, but the Pathfinder system, which is just 3.5 ODL. And so you can start the game with one of the characters that are in the story kind of deal. Like, you can be a specific character, mm -hmm. or you can make your own character. So mm -hmm. this is equivalent to playing, like, um, Baldur's Gate with a, 
remade character that has a name mm-hmm. or building your own character. And so the game throws you into character creation and I'm fairly familiar with the rules for 3.5 mm-hmm. and Pathfinder is very heavily built on those. So I'm very familiar with a lot of Pathfinder set, uh, stuff as well. Yeah. But the game throws you in and doesn't really explain all of this stuff very well. And there are key differences between Pathfinder and 3.5 where I was sitting there in character creation going, what is this? Mm-hmm. I don't know what this thing is. What is this actual stat for? Yeah. And I was looking at it going, what? Yeah. Or just ways that things were described or ways that the class mechanics worked out in wording that didn't make sense. Right. And so I, even with my extensive knowledge of, of 3.5 mechanics, I had to play this game, several different characters I built to see how the, the game mechanics work, but also how the class mechanics work. Because I know there was one class, and I was like, oh, that sounds really cool, and I tried it, and it sounds really cool, but in practice, it doesn't really feel quite as cool. It's very confusing in practice. Right. And I was just like, all right, guess I'll make a different character. I'm just going to make characters until something works correctly. <laughs> until something feels good. And I've played those kinds of games, too. And I think it was one of my biggest fears of going into, like, a and d or playing any system is the part where I have to make my character. Because if you're not familiar with a system, you're always worried that I am going to, before I even start, I've made my character wrong, and then I'm screwed. Like, like, yeah. like I've built my character wrong because I don't have any reference point as to what I'm supposed to do. Something that happened to me in, in a video game, actually, was, and I really like this game too, I, I don't want to say that I didn't like it, was Divinity Original Sin, if you're not familiar. Uh-huh. Yeah. No, I'm familiar with it. Yep, yep, yep. I played, I played the original. I haven't played the second one. I hear the second one is amazing, and I do want to play it, but I, specifically the first one. When you get to character creation, they kind of just let you do it, it open-ended. You have two PC characters that you get to play, dual characters. We might come back to that in a different episode. Uh, but you, you get to build two different characters in that. And they basically have, have a bunch of different stats, and these stats equate to different things in the game. And you, you don't really understand it up at the front. They give you the information, but I didn't really get that proportionately intelligence is a much more used stat than like your physical strength or dexterity yeah because of the skill lines and once you actually look at it like you you start looking at your different skill lines which is like a, a couple pages over in character creation you start to realize that like five of the different skill classes are intelligence based and like only one is strength-based, two are dexterity-based. <laughs> Intelligence is actually much more used for a lot of active abilities and stats, but you wouldn't necessarily know that until you've possibly already started the game <laughs> and and have, have already built characters and have gotten a little further in. Of course, that d- just basically meant that I had this one character who was just good at doing spells all the time. <laughs> And then I had right. to try and just raise her spell abilities in, like, four different elemental classes equally. <laughs> Oops. I was Good. like, Good time. There's, that's going to take up a lot of her skill points. <laughs> Even just a little hint, just a little information, a little blurb or something that would have just said, intelligence is really a favorite stat for a lot of active sp- skills, or so- something like that. Just a suggestion, something that I could look at as a reference point would have been, really well appreciated for someone who's not familiar with the system that they obviously, you know, were working on from, like, previous titles and stuff like that in the right. Divinity series, you know, mm-hmm. because it's not the same as D&D. So I didn't have that as a reference point at all. It's also the same reason why usually you'll see a lot of games, especially bigger RPGs, that will start, like, from your level 1 to your level 2, as basically an introduction segment, yeah. Uh, so that you're not really into the main game until you've gone through the process of leveling at least once. Even in D and D, like your archetypes don't come into yeah. play until like second or third level, 
Yeah. So you can get familiar with something before you go down a route that defines your yes. character better. Which which is kind of nice too, because then you're not getting overwhelmed at your character creation and your right. first couple levels. Yeah. Because one of the best ways for I think new players to get familiar with the system is to play in it. But they do have to have like some kind of baseline information about what you're doing <laughs> in order to right. start. And it just got me to thinking about how being one kind of transparent as a designer uh, about like what your influences are, what you were trying to build, the concept you were trying to put out there and just like making that known right. can sometimes be really useful for players because they go, oh, this was where his head was at. This is where their their mindset was. Now I can kind of put myself in there. Now I'm kind of primed to understand what the what the purpose of these mechanics are. Right. Now I can get into headier ideas. Was that something that you ever thought about like with with development? Did you ever notice that with games? Sometimes I know that it's useful Again, to have those couple levels and, and thinking of those things where it's like, how do I make this more accessible? Mm -hmm. It's really important yeah. um, for people to actually notice. Right. What would you say would be kind of like useful information that's maybe not mechanical information, but useful information if you have somebody who's running this system, blank slate? I mean, the best thing there is to... Uh, be able to read the rules and make sure you acknowledge what they mean at the party and stuff like run over the basics of that with mm -hmm. your group right um because if you're like hey i'm new to this and they're all new to it it's fine but if you're new to it and they're all veterans be like hey so i'm new to this i want to try it mm -hmm. could you guys kind of like help me out with the stuff that i'm looking at? um i'm learning here i feel like it's something that can be very easily overlooked when you're designing a game like, you know, the, the designing of a game can be a very long and very personal process. And so when you put it out there for people, um, they might not really understand the intent or, or the reason why you built something a certain way. And trying to explain that so that even if they're coming in cold, they really have a good understanding of the reason you built it. Not just the mechanics of it, but even just the reason why you wanted to build it can be incredibly helpful. Yeah, no, that's, it's definitely good to have those insights, too, because if it's explained out, then people can figure out a bit why. Because, I mean, you can have an intention behind your, behind your game, but like when people get a hold of the rule book, some, some of them, that's all they have. <laughs> it's just, just the piece of paper in front of them for a reference point. So sometimes that has to almost have your personality in it to really resonate. I think those are all important things okay. because each game does have its own vibe and its own basic personality, as you put it. Yeah. Um, they all have their own distinct feel. Yeah. And that's really important. Yeah, so. yeah. Like when we were talking about Avarice, you know, just just right up at the gate when um, when he says, we were thinking of Dwarf Fortress. Well, you, I didn't know about Dwarf Fortress, but you did. <laughs> so, I did know about Dwarf Fortress. So you at least... I've been playing RimWorld lately, so, yeah. you know. So at least you were like, oh, I get your mindset immediately. <laughs> yeah, I no, I, I was like, wait, I know this thing that you're talking about. This is a fantastically terrible thing you're talking about, <laughs> but mostly fantastic. So it's one of those things where I feel... Like, you know, we all get influenced by something. We do. Whatever that influence may be. But whatever your influence is, sometimes it's really helpful to just explain that and try to, to make people as jazzed up or as passionate about something before you even explain to them what's going on. Because, you know, it just gets me into a headspace. What, like, they do for D&D &D by kind of just explaining what the characters are and everything, by the time I get to the mechanics itself, I kind of feel like I've put myself into the shoes of that character. Right. I, I've, I've sort of kind of like, I, for, the, for my monk, you know, I've already kind of like put on, I've gotten my quarterstaff, I've gotten into my, my attack stance, and so when you tell me, here's what you do, here's your martial arts skill, I'm like, oh, right, martial arts, that's a thing I do. Now I Martial arts are a thing, I use my fists. I use my fists a lot. <laughs> it's, and again, it's just something that's not necessarily crunchy, it's not necessarily mechanical, but it is really useful for people who don't understand your system, or have not been exposed to it before. Being clear. 
mm. is really important, but being simple is also really important because if you want the new players to get into what you're doing, yeah. I have a bird climbing all over my microphone, by the way. That's cool. I'm not sure if you've noticed it, but yeah, like he's been climbing up there for like 10 minutes. He's happy. He's now chewing on my cords, though, so I'm unhappy. Oh, no, don't. Daryl, get Daryl, off the cords. Daryl, no, those, Thank are, you. those are not cords. Oh, God. He's on my screen now. He's probably going to start trying to pick at it again. He likes to try and pull the screen apart. <laughs> Alex, if uh, listeners to the show wanted to help comprehend us here at Delve, where could they go? Probably somewhere else. Let's be real. Yeah. No comprehension. They could probably go to our Discord. That's a great place to comprehend us. They could us. go to our Discord. Or you could go to the website at www.delvcast.com. Yeah, you can go right there. All of our projects are up uh, at that location. You can also find us on uh, Patreon. You can click on the little Patreon banner there, and you'll get the full extended bird-filled episodes <laughs> up there, if you so choose. Also, don't forget to check us out on a variety of podcast apps like Apple Podcasts, or iTunes, as I think it used to be called, the artist formerly known as iTunes. <laughs> um, right. <laughs> Google Play, uh, iHeartRadio, you can find us on Spotify, basically anywhere you find podcast apps. Please rate and review and subscribe, that'd be great. And uh, don't forget to find us on Twitter. I am at Citanium. I am at EXP Limited, and the show is at Dell Podcast. And uh, tell us what mechanics you like in games. I want to I wanna actually ask questions of the audience. What question could we ask them after this episode? What's your favorite bird? Just what's your favorite bird? <laughs> That's a good question. What's your favorite mechanic involving birds? Uh, deep frying. <laughs> <laughs> That's my answer to that question. Deep okay, uh, okay, better question. What's your favorite game that involves birds? I can make a game out of anything with chicken nuggets. And it cannot be Had a Full Boyfriend. <laughs> Jesus Christ. That is not the game we're making. Thank you all for joining us here on Delve. We will see you on the next episode. Goodbye. Bye. Yeah. Now you're looking at my webcam again. He's not looking the wall anymore. <sighs> Man. He's looking at that other thing. That's why we can't have nice birds. Hey, don't pick at it. You can just edit this whole chunk out. It's fine. Oh, no, this is staying in. <laughs> oh, this is, all, this is all staying in the episode now. This is all staying in. Yep. People want more bird talk on the show. <laughs> <laughs>